Now it's my uh, pleasure to uh, just uh, briefly introduce uh, Dr. Michelle Goman uh, from the Tonawanda Band of Seneca. Uh, she is a professor of gender studies, American Indian studies, and is an affiliated faculty of critical race studies in the law school of the University of uh, California, Los Angeles, UCLA. Um, and uh, she is the inaugural special advisor to the chancellor on native American and indigenous affairs at UCLA, our kind of partner university, or some would say rival university on the other <laughs> end. <laughs> um, but uh, I keep this brief and I wanna just to uh, uh, inform you that uh, all the introductions will be kept brief so that we have more time to talk and uh, the uh, longer biographies with all the important published works are in, uh, in your package so you can kind of uh, go into uh, deeper in them, either prepare for panels or kind of debrief after, after panels. So, Michelle, oh, there you are, okay. Welcome. Thank you. Now I see Khan, everybody. Just one correction, I'm now at, I'm on leave from UCLA and I'm at <laughs> University at Buffalo in my home territories. So, now I see Khan. I am Shauna Goman. I'm Tanawanda uh, Band of Seneca, daughter of an enrolled Hawk Clan member as well. And you'll find uh, my home territories in Western New York, New York or, um, up in up near Buffalo. So today I come to you, oops, sorry, <laughs> come to you today, oops. my best with a good mind. This is the repeated sentence in the Gnotno, the Thanksgiving address, the words that come before all else. I come to engage with good intentions and give thanks for what stories have taught me. Hold on, are you ready? <laughs> That's okay. Uh, and I come engaged with these stories, not just the stories from the Six Nations, the Haudenosaunee, or my family, but stories that create, create relationships between vast geographies, peoples, and temporalities, both past and present, as well as those yet to come. This particular story that we'll be talking about today will be about indigenous presence. I thought that was an important given the topic of this, uh, these conversations. These are also about connections among each other. That is what our Gnotno does. It's about connections and relationships to all things, including the more than human. It's a guide for our life. It's a guide to create relationships and creativity, which I believe really has to be a part of these discussions. So this, these connections are about native and non-native and the states of violence that are meant to upend and control our relationships to each other. In Los Angeles, we see laid bare not only the problems of Eurocentric philosophies, but those constructed centers of power that form policy and construct our material surroundings. Tavangar is the home of the Tamva people who have faced a long trajectory of destruction from colonization to an ongoing mass development that results in continued climate change. It remains a violent occupation. Yet the Tamva, like the Haudenosaunee, continue to survive, thrive, and culturally resurge and make story despite the violence and asymmetrical relationships of power. I cannot speak for the Tomva here, and I really want to make that clear. They can speak for themselves, and with that, I will just wanted to include one of the videos in our maps that will include the perspectives of the Gabalino Tomva. Um, and I just want to say that this is only one of the stories where they have generously shared their stories of place to create awareness within our project mapping Indigenous LA. But I did want to make clear, because I, I, I thought Tina or, or Jessa might be here today, that these are their stories and you can find them in our story maps that we created here. Um, as you can see, these are not Cartesian maps necessarily. They are maps that tell deep stories of places. And we can talk about the different forms of mapping that uh, can occur, but I wanted to play this because um, I'm not seeing any Gabrielino Tamva in the room that I know. And if I don't know you, I would lo love to.
is it the sound's not working oh there it goes Momarahiko pararahamino, 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 Momarahiko pararahamino, Momarahiko pararahamino, 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 pararahamino. In this we hear Craig Torres, who is a tribal elder that I worked with um, in Cindy Alvitre and Georgina Sanchez, who bring us Momot Ahiko, which uh, this is a song from the Tiat Society, which is the Canoe Society. So, so I thought it at May I have some tech, tech help here getting out? <laughs> I thought it was helpful to be able to have that video there to share with you, especially as that welcomes those from the Pacific in. And so it's an important song in relation to that. In doing the maps and constructing the maps, you notice it says a perspectives of a selection of Gabrielino Tomva places. Now the maps that we did for mapping in Indigenous LA, which is a project we put together in 2015, um, was a project that we realized could never capture a whole history and stories of the people whose lands we all are on now as guests or settlers. And I'll talk about that too. So I believe I was supposed to speak primarily of this map to locate us in the scene, but I found in the limited time I had for the preparation that I could not do as so as usually we speak with community members. So I don't really necessarily like to speak about this project without having Craig, Cindy, Desiree, even the, the youth, Mitzla, or one of the community members with me. So I've kind of um, worked on this talk to bring in the Ho my community, Haudenosaunee people, and look at what it means to be a guest on our lands and what it means to conduct research and do this work in relation with people. So I've talked about process previously, and I'm really happy to do so in Q&A, but I wish to use our time together to set an intentionality of relations, to create presence before the days are spent speaking to only violence and destruction. That, not that that's what you all are going to do, I'm sure, but I know it's a heavy topic as we talked about. So how to find strength and better relationships is a question affecting all of us, though far from equally, and I want to make that clear. As we see the disproportionate effects of COVID-19, climate change, and its development across the globe, we must look to those asymmetrical powers of relation. Facing a pandemic and racial upheaval, upheaval that, while it erases us in visual terrains, is foundational to the history of where we now sit, is something we also all must address. I'm reminded here of Acoma Pueblo writer Simon Ortiz, who ominously warns the reader, not as a lament, but as a prophetic request that the pioneers and soldiers who participated in the Sand Creek Massacre could have taken an alternative path to careless destruction. Quote, pain and death did not have to be propagated as darkness and wrong and coldness. They could have listened and listened and learned to sing in Arapaho, right? Our songs contain those really important knowledges. Ortiz in the seminal work, uh, uh, work connects colonialism and imperialism and speaks to the relationship of Manifest Destiny, the Sand Creek Massacre, the violence at home and abroad in Vietnam, and the after effects of limiting our imaginations and relationships to each other. That limiting of imagination is what I wish to address here. The limits of imagining connections are so often enclosed in various spatial formations at different scales from nation state to nation state and territory not defined as relationships but made from raw power 
to various ways that racialized spaces are constructed and normalized, to the very scale of our bodies that so many struggle to liberate and or to celebrate, despite the ever responding racial logics pinning us down in constructed hierarchies. As you speak to violence done, it is my hope you also listen to the Mamahiko song and remember this relationality and creation that is constant and ongoing, and we just have to look around us and see land not as property, but that can continual acts of creation. Indians are the singing remnants or graffiti in the words of Leanne Simpson. The, the form this graffiti takes are as numerous as our nations, abundant as our ancestors who loved, lived, and passed down knowledge of our lands and histories. You are the result of the love of thousands, writes Chickasaw writer Linda Hogan, who beseeches us to listen to the environment surrounding us. Deborah Miranda, Coastal Esalon, and Chumash, which are just to the north of here, reminds us that we are also the result of violent histories in her tribal memoir, Bad Indians, a book which I think both Ben and I teach um, at UCLA, but it is a book which relishes in the tales of her ancestors, the Bad Indians, who resist and act out in order to survive. This harm and genocide and the settler mapping of worlds too must be attuned to in surroundings and in our quote, bar our bodies that are bridges over which our descendants cross, spanning unimaginable landscapes of loss. In the following words of Leanne Simpson that inspires a lot of my work and that creativity and ongoing creation, um, that we must come to understand that architecture of erasing us. And this is what this, the Mapping Indigenous LA project was about, was finding new ways to come to think about the places where we emerge and that ongoing creation as well. Havangna is the site of the emergence space of Ahachiman, which are to the south of here, and also of uh, the Gabrielino Tamva peoples as well. So the work that inspired this makes clear in Leanne Simpson's poem that is not something that happened accidentally, right? This happened in the constructions of space that we see around us, the buildings, the formation of Los Angeles, uh, are those constrictions of space meant to cut those relationships, and those were intentional. Erasing Indians is a good idea, of course, writes uh, Simpson in her poem. The bleeding heart liberals and communists can stop feeling bad for the stealing and raping and murdering, and we can all move on, we can all be reconciled, except I am graffiti, except mistakes were made. It is these mistakes, this ongoing indigenous inscription on American landscape that denies the permeability of settler colonialism and exposes the powerful maps of commerce and subjugation. So often when we are putting together the maps of indigenous LA that you see here, um, the people that I worked with didn't wanna just talk about construction and as, uh, just talk about the erasure and just talk about the violence. They didn't want to map their genocidal sites, they wanted to map their life, the life creative forces. So this is very much a part of how we approach these maps. So it is these mistakes of the, that inscription are stories etched on the landscape that we tell in our, our particular maps. So throughout your time in LA, not when you see the, when it, note when you see the NGA at the end of a street sign, those are part of that graffiti that is left, that's part of the language of the Gabrielino Tomba. Listen to um, Jessa or Susanna Kite sing a story, or listen to an interview with Craig Torres, visit Caravagna, which is a spring site that's a mile and a half from UCLA's campus, and one of the only freshwater sites not put under concrete in the city of LA. Think about where your water comes from as you attend the conference. A lot of water comes from the northern Paiute, where Maholland took the water and created, and DWP took the water, and uh, from those relatives that are also to the east, northeast of us. Um, I think that's an important to note, right? That water is connection, that land is connection. We did have a water map that was done in 2016 by a student of both uh, Professor Madley and I's 
um, at one point, but so much work is being done on water that we kind of um, we do plan on redoing that and putting that putting that up before we archive the project as well. Now this water was used to support Yangna, which is downtown Los Angeles and those waterways and the relationship of stolen water between the Gabrielino Tomva and the Hotchman and the mass development that occurring here is part of that ongoing violence. When I say please visit Karavangna, it's a space that is open. It's a space often where Native Hawaiians, Pacific Islanders visit, where Oaxacans, Zapoteca, and the indigenous people of LA go to understand that freshwater site as one of those sacred village sites that, that exists. That site itself produces over 56,000 gallons of water in West LA. So, it is especially that we see in the stories of Indigenous people that we see the colonial weight of living in what Audra Simpson calls nested sovereignties and of inhabiting bodies that are governed by these various narrated borders. I want, as the conference go forward, to reflect, respect, and remember those living presences of the bridges between our ancestors, the bridges of Indigenous bodies and what that means and that relationship to the more than human where we come. Now, we came to mapping Indigenous LA through the various experiences we had as Indigenous people in Los Angeles. And this is largely through conversations with my colleagues at UCLA, Keith Camacho, who's from Guam, myself, who's a transplant um, from, from uh, Western New York. I, and um, we were out, I was out on Catalina Island or Pimu when we had a discussion it's a long discussion. I can talk about this because it's going to sound crazy, but a discussion about birth control and the buffalo that are out at <laughs> on the island. I'm a fan of just eating them, but there was a moment where they were transporting them back to Rosebud and there's buffalo out in the middle of uh, Catalina Island, which is Pimu in Tomba language. And um, they brought they brought an elder out, a medicine man to give a uh, to, to give a ceremony before they removed the buffalo. But during that, he's like, who lived here? And they didn't ask a tribal member to participate in that, right? So this is like consistently when I came to LA as a Haudenosaunee woman, the first thing you do is introduce yourself to the people you're on. You follow those protocols, you work with that. So I had been having a relationship with the Gabrielino Tomba and um, through various connections, and in relation to that, we came to talk as faculty about why aren't people communicating amongst each other when the Gabrielino Tamva people are just over 2300 people right now and growing there's been the more attention, the more people are also growing. Um, the more that 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 happened, we were like let's how can we set up to have these conversations with people as well so. What these maps were intended to do was not only create visibility for the Tomva and, and that visibility as they see fit as part of the project, these perspectives are ones that we vetted with the community over and over again. Um, the community decided what spots that they wanted to talk about and how they wanted to talk about, particularly this, this, the, this particular map is a perspective. This doesn't encapsulate every Tomva person there's not a set of spots across LA. Each village, there are multiple villages. People have multiple stories in multiple lineages. So we took that into account. But this is also how they wanted to uh, talk about themselves. So that was the visibility. We also wanted to create education of the indigenous placemaking in the diaspora that takes places and comprises Los Angeles. We wanted to bridge communities and spark understanding between the indigenous communities that call LA home. So in our Latin American and indigenous diaspora map, we know that a lot of people came here because of the mass violence that they experienced in their home, or even that harnessing again of water in which they couldn't support their families because their farmlands had dried up as Mexico developed in those places as well. Um, so I highly encourage you also to look at our Zapoteca map that's there in the Latin American Indigenous Diaspora map. 
the Pacific Islander map will be coming soon. I've been saying this for years. I feel like um, that was a little harder because we get we um, the the Pacific Islander communities that also came here, which are located largely near the airport in Carson City. They um, came as communities, and we're still working. We're working with Epic, the Empowering Pacific Islander Communities now, and Julianne Anasi is overseeing that particular map. She's a Samoan scholar at UCLA, so it's it's coming. <laughs> So we we did these as a way so which communities could convey their own placemaking methods, not translate or extract as knowledges for them, but have a site where their stories would be the ones they want to tell. Now, I speak to these specific goals as too often um, Indigenous people are treated as a history project or a Cartesian map right that this is like a tourist site that we can go visit but we needed to have these deep stories to create a deeper understanding of the land a deeper understanding of how to respect and live in reciprocity so often um, sometimes people do come to me and it perplexes them that there's not a linear trajectory or a cartesian map with location points like geolocation points in the same way but we knew as in talking with with the elders that I worked with and talking with others, that you can express a thousand truths primarily through research, and that would not change necessarily the erasure and the ongoing exclusion and violence. So mapping a history of the landscape by creating a new narrative or a true narrative is not enough. As Maori scholar Linda Chwehi Smith states, we believe that history is about justice, that understanding history will enlighten our decisions about the future. Wrong. History is also about power. In fact, history is mostly about power. A thousand accounts of the truth will not alter the fact that Indigenous people are still marginal and do not possess the power to transform history into justice. The Gabrielino Tamba, who comprise a, a small a part of the population, do not possess that population control and cannot use the form of voting or democracy to make the change that is needed just by telling their truth. So across California, people are aware of the raw deal, often the embezzlement, the genocide, and the so-called lost treaties. They have been for years. Rather, to continue with the words of Linda Tuehi Smith, we must also think about this as about reconciling and reprioritizing what is really important about the past with what is important about the present. And I feel that speaks a lot to the maps that we created here. Here you see um, the Los Angeles Harbor became an important part. These are the reprioritizing of spaces that um, the Tamva people felt important. And they also chose the images on the side. So they also saw their relationships. We did a we did a uh, event on Pacific Islander and Gabrielino Tamba relationships at UCLA. And there's a blog that, that you see. And Cindy Alvitra said something very important that they see themselves as Eastern Oceana. And that really struck with people, with those canoe societies, with those connections. Because in reality, if you think about place based people, that's the ocean that's shared, right? They have more in common than, say, with Navajo people who don't ha share that same ocean. So these are kind of the ways we can kind of unpack and rethink the geographies which frame our understanding and our understanding, which is a form of violence itself, that, that understanding often. The communities of this land were supposed to be wiped from memory, but the relationship to land is forever etched if discouraged by the noise of colonization. The songs, arts, stories are the graffiti, a generative refusal. Graffiti is the memories and practices that undo the evidence of our subjugation, rupture lands as merely property, and can undo the separation of humans and the more than human. Cultural production and everyday acts of resurgence, even the little ones of understanding where your water comes from, have the force to undo a colonial unknowing defined by Goldstein and, and others um, as produced in practice and in concert with material acts of violence and differential devaluations that are striving to preclude relational models of analysis and ways of knowing otherwise. So these maps were about confronting those differential devaluations. We refuse the, the pinpointing of massacre sites, but rather chose life and the pinpointing of those sites of creativity and emergence.
So Mila focuses on the stories as other means of knowledge production and care about Indigenous placemaking. I know here I was supposed to do just an introduction to Tavangar, but to speak to Tavangar is also to speak to relationality, to speak to the stories of place, um, not only through a research project, but how I should conduct myself as a Haudenosaunee woman, as a guest on Tomba land. Rather, I encourage you all to take today an initiative also to explore our maps here. You'll find various information on them as well. So our goal was creating a presence not trapped or pigeonholed or an unable to expand in the settler logics of enclosure is pertinent and is necessary, these kind of maps for all of us. We do not need an inclusion that is additive and tokenized, and most of all, one that does not uproot settler foundations. I'm a big fan of not, <laughs> I use anti-colonial and not decolonial for this manner. It's a praxis, being anti-colonial is a praxis. And we have to be aware every day, like, and, and there may be missteps along the way, but we have to consistently say, are we being anti-colonial in this moment and recognize when we're not. We need to, in the words of Audra Simpson, have those generative refusals, which we see in even the smallest words of our ancestors. We need to rewrite, rewrite, as Cachabaldi states, and above all, there's a need to reframe an understanding not only of how we've gotten to this point, but also how do we move forward from this point. Our maps were important at the time, and now others, people who have much more money, produce other story maps as well. Um, we actually opened this up. Anybody, we have a visit our story map site that you'll see here. We have Indigenous Crossroads and Currents, um, which uh, we realized was needed. We had a powwow map that was uh, going to be done by a student, but didn't quite happen. Um, we found that there are all these places where we did meet. So eventually, because it's a digital project, we got to add that particular category as well. Um, it was needed because there are a lot more meeting places occurring than what we also had originally imagined. The American Indian maps that we have here, that came from community um, work. You will have a chance to meet with Kelly uh, Leah Stewart, who did the education map, and that's a history of education in the boarding school processes as well um, in the area. Um, there, there was also a request for an Indian health resource map and other elements here as well. Um, we also realized as we create created these maps that there needed to be a curriculum that accompanied them because we were getting a lot of uh, contacts with K through 12 teachers and those teachers were like, well, I love the maps, but what do we do with them? And so we worked with the tribal elders uh, to create this particular curriculum. So this was done in a workshop space at Caravagna Springs with all the tribal educators who hadn't gotten together in the last 20 to 25 years. So it was really a momentous event for them to meet each other, to have those spaces. And I can talk about what that means too. So because it is a living community, because Indigenous people were not eradicated and our knowledge exists to sustain us, sustain us still, we will continue to need new maps and to tell the relationship to land. As precious items are returned and land rematriated, communities of reciprocity, relationality, are reminded again of the words of Deborah Miranda, who says, we think we are too broken to ever be whole again. But it's not true. We can be whole just differently. To get to this point of wholeness, all of us must take responsibility and accountability, and we must begin to undo the afterlives of covenant codes and their afterlifes that make up LA. We must map new ways to relate to land outside of plundering and respect water that we cannot live without in Los Angeles. We cannot separate past genocide from the spatial construction of the present, and we must continue to make public spaces that undo the visual trains of destruction. Most of all, this means moving forward with creating a presence with purpose and intentionality and in relation to one another, what we refer to in Haudenosaunee philosophies and stories as go forth with a good mind. So let it be that way in our minds. Also, um, now our minds are one. So, Nyawe. Thank you. Did you want me to answer? Yeah. Take questions. Any questions for Audrey? I have more of a statement than a question. Um, 
Check, 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 check. I was just gonna say more of a statement than a question. Um, I really appreciate, and I think for my personal background, this has come up in frontline spaces a lot the past few years, and especially since Standing Rock, um, the desire and the need for new creation stories, essentially. And I think a lot of, of this project and um, the reclamation that's happening through identity and everything else kind of ties into that. It's like what, we can't let creation stories become destruction stories, and so we can't let the spaces either. So I just, I really appreciate that. That's beautiful. Thank you. That was actually something the elders, uh, well, not just the elders, but the youth expressed. They didn't want to just tell, and when I worked on the land acknowledgement at UCLA with, with the people, they didn't want, um, there was a student group, and, and they're very sweet, and they, they had the best of intentions, but they didn't talk during that land during that kind of land acknowledgement, those early stages with the community and what they wanted. So I encourage you all, if you do, are doing this kind of work, to talk to the community whose lands you are on before you put forth some of those things. Because they want it to be remembered as, on, not remembered, but like acknowledged as ongoing, living people with a presence and emerging, right? That's where the emerging part came in our land acknowledgement at UCLA. So. Thank you, that was really beautiful. Thank and you. it's so nice to, have a sense of where we are. And I'm just wondering if you could say a few more words about the water. I noticed that in the hotel they give you all bottled water and I don't know if you can drink tap water and there's this strange relationship with you know pollution and mining and what's going on with water? Can you say a bit more <laughs> about that? Well, there's a lot of really good work being done on water in Los Angeles right, right now um, by um, scientists melding at, at uh, UCLA, there's the diversity in water perspectives that is being led by Aradna Tripathi and Jessica Catalino. Um, and they've, um, they're at UCLA, some of us have worked with the Paiute for a long time, and between the Paiute and, um, and that, kind of, that kind of relationship, but uh, Nestle, which is the, you know, everybody knows Nestle, right? They're doing harm all over. They're draining those lakes and so you can see online um they have i can't remember the the website but i can make sure that martha gets it and to email out more information on that particular particular element but this started early on when the tamba were made to work to create waterways so that the flooding wouldn't occur and there are a lot of natural springs around when i first got to los angeles I, I, said, I referenced it as a desert, and I got jumped on, <laughs> right? which is one of the mistakes I made. It's not a desert. It's a Mediterranean climate, right? It just appears hot because all that water is under the cement, all that fresh water, right? And, and you know, it's probably a little back east biased in my, you know, we have a lot of rivers and lakes. and <laughs> So um, it was just coming to a new land and starting to understand it, but starting to understand all the waterways that are under... Like, just to let you know, they thought a new spring had sprung up at Caravagna, but it wasn't. It was a broken water main. And LAUSD probably lost over $230,000 in water bills, like wasted money and wasted water, which is so precious, because they didn't even know that water line was broken, right? So I think there's a particular way that the lack of even attention or awareness of, of that and where the water comes from and what's going on in these areas up in northern Pi land in Lone Pine in those areas we have to create that awareness of water because as expansion happens it's it's actually the water is coming from other people's resources so, Thank you. Let's move on. Thank you so much. Yeah. <laughs>